Okay, great. Okay, Assalamualaikum and good morning, everyone. Um, so, um, thank you very much for joining Neuroemergency CME class. Um, for information, for those of you who are still new and this is your first time of joining, uh, we have this Neuroemergency CME class uh, once a month. So, we have uh, speakers from various disciplines, not just emergency physicians. We also have uh, from neurologists. And today, we are very um, um, glad to have uh, Mr. Regunat Kandasamy who is a consultant neurosurgeon and head of department in clinical Kuala Lumpur. Um, he's a very successful person, all right? Uh, he's the chairman of Education Subcommittee NSR and then Honorary Secretary Neurosurgical Association of Malaysia and uh, Asian. And um, he is also an uh, honorary lecturer Department of Neuroscience in University Science of Malaysia. So um, he's a good teacher. I learned a lot from him when I was doing my master's back then uh, about a few, few years ago. So um, thank you uh, for joining us, uh, Mr. Regu, and thank you for your time, uh, for uh, your agreement in delivering, delivering um, a very nice lecture today on imaging and brain trauma. Um, so uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Regunat um, to proceed uh, with his lecture. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson. You are very kind with your accolades. Uh, it's actually a, always a moment of pride for somebody who was in the like, university for so many years, you know, prior to this, to see one of our students, you know, uh, flourish into a capable specialist, you know, not only in, from the clinical side of view, and, but also, you know, uh, academic, you know, pushing the teaching agenda. So, yeah, I think uh, Nasrina has mentioned to you, I mean, yes, currently I'm in the private sector, but I had a good number of years in the university and I still go back try my best uh, to teach, uh, albeit limited a little bit by COVID. So uh, I've chosen a topic which I think is uh, can be very basic, but at the same time, is of cardinal or extreme importance to you know young doctors, uh, especially uh, if you realize uh, whether you like it or not, trauma is, is here to stay. It's a very significant uh, uh, epidemiological problem in this part of the world. Uh, when you, I mean, as young doctors, you complete your housemanship, you're going to get um, end up in a district very likely, right? And in the district, what is the commonest thing you're going to be doing when you, I mean, one of, among the commonest things you're going to be doing in the ED or is you're going to meet patients who have undergone brain trauma. Now, so being able to evaluate these patients in detail is, is, is very important now. Let me just move on. I'm trying to go to make it as interesting as possible with a lot of pictures. See, uh, now, in general, if you, you just have to be clear, the role of imaging is, of course, to detect and evaluate injury. I think this is a given, you know this. And naturally, based on that, you want to guide your treatment decisions. But I think it's very important to remember these additional two things that you must be thinking about when you're looking at an image. What? To anticipate associated conditions. You, the scan must speak to you. Sometimes it screams at you. Sometimes it whispers to you but you must be able to hear both the screams and the whispers as a practicing doctor, all right? Only then will you be able to not realize that, oh, we should have done this earlier, you know, or why? So this is the thing. And of course, with the information provided to you with on the scan, you are able to risk stratify and prognosticate. Because you see, very often when you're in the, on the line of duty, family will ask you, doctor, what do you think? What's the chances? So I think we should move away from the, the 50, 50, 60, 70 approach, you know, that's not, uh, that's not scientifically based. So you, you have to be aware of severity grading systems in order to give a proper answer. All right. So basically my lecture today, I'll be a little bit long. Uh, I'll talk about the basic modalities in terms of where the utility is, why, what do you use it for? Some of the indications and we'll go on to uh, some algorithms or scan evaluating where I'll also show you common lesions and maybe we'll add in a little bit of information about what are the indications for intervention in these situations. Because I think it's as important as it is to know what you're looking at, you need to know what, whether something needs to be done. All right. I will touch a bit on common errors and nuances, a little bit on, I mean, I'll have some case illustrations, uh, just some of the interesting ones and some future directions. Okay. So essentially the two primary modalities that form the backbone of assessment of uh, trauma care is uh, X-rays and CT scans. I think you all are well aware of this, but we also have adjunctive modalities. They don't come into play all the time, but you have to ask for them. And you must know when to ask for them in order to benefit from them. See, MRIs generally are not a center piece of assessment because you have to put the patient in the MRI room for a long period of time. And, you know, that's going to sometimes compromise on safety. 
Similarly, angiography, venography involves giving a big dose of contrast. And of course, when it's indicated, it's indicated. You just can't run away from it. But you got to know when to order. Lah. And some of the newer imaging symptoms like DTI sequence, uh, magnetic resonance, um, spectroscopy, connectomics are more uh, of a you know, research interest you know, when some, and prognosticating long-term prognosticating uh, information. Okay, just, I just included them here for so that you know there is a role. Now, um, see, essentially radiographs and CT are to identify life-threatening conditions. Now, when do you use an MRI? MRIs are usually for further evaluation, particularly when your neurological findings do not tally with the scan. This is something that you must train yourself to learn to do, you know. Uh, if the picture doesn't fit, sometimes you have to think about what is the scan whispering to you. Because if not, uh, well, lo and behold, when you repeat the scan after 24 or 48 hours, you know, there's a disaster has already happened. So anticipation, 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 right? Uh, as, as I mentioned, angiography and venography is associated injury that may manifest later. A lot of the vascular injuries will happen during point of trauma, but they only manifest after 24 hours. So you can be very happy with a clinically well patient whose scan appears normal, but if you don't pick up the subtle signs, you are suddenly the patient will deteriorate. And you, you know, you may be too late sometimes. Okay, so moving on, uh, X-rays. So the the humble X-ray has come a long way, lah. You know, from what it used to be. But I will not say that it's, of course, less utilized these days. We have CT scan. You know, sometimes the uh, the process of do X-ray first and then CT scan. You know, we are moving away from that because quick work, moving fast. But there is a role for X-rays, particularly when you're dealing with penetrating injuries. If you realize when you got a nice foreign body sitting in the base of the skull, the CT scan with all its artifacts may not be able to show you with extreme accuracy what you know what you're dealing with, how many pieces are there. So there is definitely a role, you know, when you have penetrating foreign bodies. Number one, especially small ones, you know, you have it's easier to see on an X-ray than a CT scan, mind you, especially when it's near the bone or the skull base where the foreign body and the skull base are similar density. All right. Additionally. There is a role for x-rays in skeletal survey when you suspect um, non-accidental injury. So these are just some things to remember at the back of your mind. Hey, you know, don't just completely throw the x-ray away. Lah. But remember, a normal x-ray does not equal to no injury. I think those of you who have worked will realize lah, and sometimes uh, you might as well just get the CT scan when the indication is there. Okay. Now moving on to the CT scan. Uh, now, this is the most in useful imaging in acute settings. It's rapidly done, good visualization. Uh, I'm highlighting this blue box here for you all to know that it's important for you all to understand what is windowing in CT scan. Now, the CT image is based on a gray white scheme called the Hounsfield range, right? So in order to be able to see specific parts of the spectrum clearly, you need to understand windowing. So standard windows are what is called your brain win uh, window where you and how you define a window is based on its window length and window width, WL. WL tells you which point along the grayscale, the, the center of your window is and the width, WW, is how far above and how far below you, are, you, are, you can visualize. Everything out of the window will be either hyperdense or hypodense, so you can't differentiate with much difference. So you see, when you want to look at the gray matter of the brain, gray and white matter, that's why you set your window length at around 25 to 35, you know, because that will be able to help you differentiate between gray matter and white matter. Similarly, bo bone window is higher because you don't have interested to differentiate the brain tissue. You just want to see ultra structural differences in the bone. Okay, this, these uh, values may not mean much. Let me show you a picture. Okay, so here you got three different standard uh, windows that you see. So this is typically a brain window with a window length of 40, which uh, somewhere in between your gray and white matter and a, win a window width of 80. So anything out of that window width means 40 plus 80, 40 below 80, you can see different, clearly you can differentiate. Everything else is hypertense. But you see, this doesn't benefit you if you want to look at the bone, you want to differentiate fractures and all subtle fractures, grooves. So that's where a higher a bone window is required. And in between this is a subdural window. Why? If there's a bleed in the subdural space sometimes, right under the bone, you you can falsely miss it, you know, because the some of the pixels come in the cross with the bone. See, remember each pixel or voxel to be specific is a mathematical average of whatever runs through that box. So imagine if there's a lot of uh, bone components, what you will get is a, a density which is in between. So you might miss it. So that's why by adjusting 
you know, subdural window, you might pick up things which you may not see on the stand, standard scan. So as practitioners, you got to ask for this. If not, sometimes you may not get it. But now with a lot of the systems, hospitals have packs. It's easier to do this. This is in the day and age, those days when we will get films to, you know, to look at. But uh, knowledge is the first step. So see, CT scan is beautiful. You get to see all the different acute pathologies quite well. Yeah. Mm. Now, it's important to know when do you order a Probably scan. Sir, okay. So generally, all patients with moderate and severe traumatic brain injury will need a scan without a doubt. For mild head injury, that it will depend to, on certain factors of the, regarding the patient's clinical status, his illness and mechanism of injury. So we have a lot of uh, international guidelines, the Canadian CT head rules, the New Orleans criteria. I'm sure you are a part of your, those of you who are training in ED will know all these criteria, but it's important to know what is our local guidelines. So, so there's a good effort that was made by the New Surgical Association together with the Academy of Medicine. And I, I, they identify some in their guidelines for early management of actually mild head injury. Uh, they've come up with criteria for immediate scan. That means immediately anybody with a GCS less than 13 or a GCS which does not improve to 15 after two hours naturally will need a scan. And of course, with evidence of possible skull fracture in all the clinical signs, seizures, neurological deficit, vomiting more than two times after the head injury. And of course, if they have, uh, they are on blood thinners, anticoagulants or antiplatelets, definitely those are all indications. I mean, I'm not going to spend too much to go through these guidelines. I want you to be aware of what are the guidelines available. We don't always have to look to the pandang ke barat, you know, we have things done here itself, all right? So this is the beginning. So similarly in these guidelines, there's also indication for urgent scan, not immediate man, within a couple of hours from the admission, you know, this is uh, mainly for the elderly, you know, who potential to develop delayed hemorrhages are highest based on, you know, being on blood thinners or bad, I mean, dangerous mechanism of injury, right? Or previous brain surgery. And those who are also can be just observed and monitored. Okay. So before I go into the details about CT scan, I just going to touch a bit about MRI. See, MRI gives us great anatomical images. In an acute setting, it's only reserved for cases, as I mentioned earlier, when the symptoms are not explained by the CT scan, you know. Uh, it is expensive, it's time consuming, and it's less sensitive for things like fracture. So you have to know when to ask for this. And it's more for prognosis. Like, okay, if you look here, this is a CT scan of a patient who, who one would say, uh, just a small contusional bleed, you know, temporal, nothing much. If you do an MRI also, you just, you notice how much more areas of injury can, you know, come up, especially in the chronic phase. So, you know, people think, ah, patients, nothing's wrong with the patient, but they might be suffering from quite significant cognitive problems, you know, and, you know, with such a small bleed. So this is where the role of MRI comes in. Okay. Uh, since we're talking about modalities, a little bit about vascular imaging. So when would you ask for a vascular image? when you have you suspect an arterial or venous injury so then the question comes up when do you suspect this okay when you should suspect the possibility of an arterial or venous injury when you have a skull based fracture that is encroaching on the carotid canal and the petrous pass of the temporal bone or if it's a skull fracture that is crossing near where the venous sinuses are located similarly if you have a cervical fracture especially you know uh, something involving the lateral mass you know near which goes near the foramen transposidium these are areas you should be worried about because you know the vertebral arteries run there so dissection doesn't ex i mean injuries doesn't necessarily happen oh, yeah. simply in the skull you know the neck is also the proper location uh, and vascular imaging is also definitely relevant when you have neurological exam findings which are not explained by a neuroimaging i'll show you this in clinical scenarios it's more interesting right Another important thing that people don't pay attention to uh, in an acute traumatic patient who suddenly comes with Horner syndrome, this is definitely an indication for you know further vascular imaging because we know that the sympathetic fibers run together with the carotids in a significant part, especially in the skull base, you know, near the cavernous sinus. Okay, left foot fractures. Also very common when they are especially bilateral, you know, and type twos and type threes, these are also common patterns where vascular injury can take place. Right? But these are usually when you see them, you already think about uh, possibility of injury, vascular injury. Now, neck soft tissue injury. This one is so commonly, you know, ignored or forgotten because it's just assumed to be just from the soft tissue. So if you see very significant 
the swellings, if there's an asymmetry in the pulse, uh, automatically you should start thinking. But I tell you something, a lot of times when you all do assessment, you don't, you're not thinking about these things, which is why, you know, the need for me to highlight these points so that, you know, you actually don't forget them sometimes, you know, when we are, you're moving along with your, your assessment. Yeah. So using case, nice case scenarios, I'll show you how things got, can nearly be missed even in an established university setting. Okay, so this is an MRA. You see, you will see the whole vascular tree. And remember, sometimes you have to ask for MRV or CTV because you may not see the venous system in an arteriogram. So there is a distinction, differentiation. It is not left to the to the our colleagues in radiology. You need to ask for it. So you need to be aware of these differences in these things. You know, they're different. They are two different phases in the study. All right. Here's a classic example. I mean, it's one of the uh, tip, uh, case scenario where you have an occipital bone fracture. I'm sure many of you have seen this before, right or not? Uh, yeah, it's just a fracture, don't have to fix, stable. But you must not forget that underneath that occipital bone fracture is the big transfer sinus, all right? And sometimes it can become thrombosed due to the impact. If you are lucky, because the patient has bilateral transfer sinus, they may not manifest with venous uh, hypertension and medius edema. But in the cases where uh, it's uh, asymmetrical or, you know, much larger on the right, which is usually the case, they can develop delayed symptoms, you know, and the, the patient may show you edema in the temporal lobe or, you know, the sagittal sinus, where, I mean, the in the supratentorial compartment, which, you know, only if you do a venogram, you'll see this. If not, you're not going to see this, right? So something to think about, you know, don't uh, treat occipital bone fractures so lightly in the future, you know, it could cause uh, this sort of injuries, you know, even extending to the jugular bulb. Okay, so now you've had an overview of where does radio uh, x-rays uh, belong, where do CT scan belong, a little bit about MRI and vascular imaging. All right, so now we will slowly move towards principles of evaluating imaging. Okay, so in a CT scan post-trauma, I mean, let's be honest, I've oh, we've all been junior at one point in time. And when you see a CT scan with so many things going on, uh, you, you are not sure where do you start, what do you do, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, you grab at pieces of information. You remember extradural, subdural from medical school or midline chief or something subdural. I need to do something. Which one is, which comes first? All right. Of course, over time, we all come up with our own systems of doing this. You know, I, I am uh, no different. You know, I have a way in my brain, you know, that kicks in. So I think part of mentoring and teaching is sharing this way with you. I'm not going to say that my way is the best. No. It is just something that I've developed over the years. And there, I also understand that our dear colleagues in the emergency medicine fraternity, are, they are very creative with mnemonics. So I'll also share that version so you can choose which one you want. All right? Okay. But it's important in your brain that these five things must be going on when you're looking at it. So your aim of looking at the scan, of course, yes, first thing is first, confirming the type of lesion that you're looking at, what is it, is it the type of the bleed, the type of the injury, all right, and the nature of the intracranial injury, number one, then you need to determine whether you need urgent surgical intervention, I think uh, anybody who's doing looking at the scan, uh, what do you call it, for intervention purposes should be clear about, or they should be aware, what is the indication for treatment, because then you know you need to act quickly, right or not? I mean, those who are doing neurosurgery, perhaps you will be you will be better worse than this. But those who are not, also, I think it's important to know, right? And are the images concordant with the patient's neurology? Are you looking at the right place? You know, uh, just because somebody has a neurological deficit, doesn't everything don't always point straight to the brain, straight to the brain. You need to be able to differentiate uh, wh whether you're looking at the right place because you can miss an injury. Another thing that you should remember is the timing of the scan. Are you underestimating the disastrous potential of a lesion in the brain because it's taken too early or too late? And of course, overall prognosis. Lah. This is definitely you know, valuable for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So let's go through. So this is a more detailed algorithm that I sort of use. Uh, number one. We look for any extra axial hemorrhages out of the center of the brain, extra dural, subdurals, or subarachnoid hemorrhages. This is the first thing I would look at. All right. Then I go in to look into the parenchyma, whether there are any contusions or intraparenchymal bleeds. Okay. So once I've identified all those things, okay, quickly, does this thing need surgery? So we basically, what 
uh, indication for surgery is a, a lesion that could potentially cause brain herniation. And the radiological uh, measures of this, uh, the most basic are uh, your midline shift and basal system effacement. Don't worry, we will go through these things in the, in the subsequent slide, but just to put it into your mind. So you're looking for intraaxial and extraaxial lesions and whether there's any signs of herniation. Okay, but sometimes there may not necessarily be, uh, you know, significant midline shift or you know, only moderate basal system effacement, the, but the brain may be swollen. So there may be brain swelling or there may be blood in the ventricles resulting in uh, some form of hydrocephalus. So these are things you should, you know, second tier start looking at. Okay. So once you have addressed the most potential dangerous things, you move on to fractures, you know, whether it's cranial wall, skull base, and then with the morphology, whether depressed, stellate, so on and so forth. Any soft tissue injuries going on? Uh, any pneumocephalus? Yep, this is commonly missed. And when you see pneumocephalus, you got to start thinking about CSF leak, you know, and some CSF leak will only manifest if you make the patient, you know, Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, so. I think I stopped at CSF leak. So as I said, sometimes when you have pneumocephalus, you've got to think of CSF leak, you're going to make the patient, you know, tilt forward, for example, that they call that a reservoir test. So the patient lying on the bed, you may, you know, erroneously say there's no leak. And of course, lastly, look for craniofacial fractures. Okay, now we go into pictures. I think nobody likes text. Okay, our EDH, everybody's favorite uh, neurosurgical condition, you know, typically lens shape, biconvex, something that you, you can intervene immediately, you get a good outcome, all right? So remember, it's usually limited within the sutural sites because the, the dura is attached to the suture point attachment. So usually that's one of the ways to say, oh, this is likely to be an extra dural. Okay, and sometimes, yes, it can cross the midline because the bleeding might be coming from a dural venous sinus. It's not always only from, uh, you know, the middle meningeal artery that has torn. You know, that is typically for temporal parietal or frontal ones. But when they cross the midline like this, you need to think of uh, uh, sagittal sinus bleed. All right. And when you're looking at an extra dural, I mean, of course, the absolute size uh, is, of course, one of the indicators for surgical treatment. If the thickness, the width, that means this way is more than 1.5 cm. Um, how many of you have heard of the term swirl sign? Okay. So sometimes when you look at an extra dural, you see this uh, hypo intense. something of uh, interest you, you must take into account because what does it say this is called a swirl sign okay a swirl sign means there is a there is a there is active bleeding going on within the extradural all right so you know it's like a coffee swirl uh, i mean i need you to be a bit creative to imagine this but essentially that is that the swirl that's going on because the artery is bleeding into the clot so when this happens uh, basically, the potential for this extra dural to grow bigger is very significant. So you need to watch these patients more carefully. Like in this particular image, even though this extra dural looks quite small, you know it may potentially expand in in, in a short period of time. So you, if you measure, oh, this is one cm, no need intervention. You may find after one hour the patient's GCS has dropped. Right. So this is something to look at when you're looking at extra durals. Okay. So. Remember, I mentioned it's good to know the indication. So any extra dural that's thicker than 1.5 cm, that means 15 mm or 30 cubic meters uh, in size needs to be taken out irrespective of the GCS. So remember this, more than 1.5 cm, rather than using 30 cm, because sometimes the evaluation of, of clot volume extra dural space is not that easy. So I think the thickness, anything more than 1.5 cm, supratentorial needs to come out. If it's less than 30 cm, but or less than 15 mm, if the GCS score is not good, I mean, it's good, you can manage. But if there's midline shift and all these things, then the thing still needs to come out. So you cannot be very pedantic. Oh, no, less than 1.5 cm, I'm not going to touch, right? If blurry changes, it needs to come out. Because you remember, the extradural may be one of many other things going on in the brain. 
right? They may be already cerebral edema or pro, uh, contributing collectively to mass effect and midline shift and pupillary changes. So as you progress through your career, you will, you will realize if you're thinking about it, hey, this one, not every 1.5 cm needs to be done. I mean, not, not, not every less than 1.5 cm is just to be ignored, you know, right? Okay, lesion number two, uh, subdurals are also very common things you see. Subdurals can be commonly like what you're seeing on the first image. It's just uh, from a torn bridging vein or it can be from uh, a contusion and then it extends into the subdural space. Now, both these images, what must strike you clearly, there's midline shift in both of them, right? But one of them, the clot is so thick. But here, the clot is very limited. So remember, thin subdurals are not necessarily your friend, right? Because the, there may be an underlying brain contusion, which is, you know, coupled with the subdural causing the mass effect. I remember very early in my career, th those days, there was no WhatsApp. You cannot just call your boss for everything in the middle of the night. Huh? So I, I sat on a subdural like this. It's a midline shift, thin subdural, no need to worry. But needless to say, next day, the pupils dilated. And uh, I learned a very painful lesson that morning, you know? Subdural, don't just go according to 1 cm, 1 cm. You have to look at the brain as a whole, you know, mass effect, herniation. Okay. So now, this is the what the Brain Trauma Foundation says about subdural. So generally, if the subdural is greater than 1 cm, that means 10 mm, or if the midline shift is more than 5 mm, the lesion should be surgically evacuated, no? Now, this is, you know, uh, irrespective of whatever the GCS. Now, so... If the patient is in a coma, all right, uh, this is where the challenge is. See, when a patient is conscious, it's so much easier because you can monitor the GCS. But when they are unconscious or, you know, the GCS score of less than nine, very likely they'll be intubated. So the only way you know what's going on in the brain is the pupils. And trust me, pupillary changes are the end, <laughs> end stage. You know, you don't have much time. The clock is already gone at that point in time. So that is why patients who are intubated, you know, who have a poor GCS, usually they will recommend ICP monitoring. So you can catch elevations in the ICP early, all right? Now, if there's an increase in ICP, of course, next exceeding 20, then definitely there's an indication for surgery. Or if there, you just say that you are monitoring the patient, GCS drops by more than two points, naturally you have to repeat a scan and consider going in. And if there are pupillary changes, remember, uh, ICP can be inaccurate, but pupils, uh, I mean, especially if they're asymmetrical findings, then definitely you need to give them some importance, okay? Don't worry, I, I'm, I'm happy to share these slides with you so that, you know, for your reference, but, you know, these are this, this is the Brain Trauma Foundation current uh, guidelines on when to intervene, okay? Subdural sometimes occur in a chronic setting, you know, elderly, uh, you know, infants, where those who are alcoholic, you know, with recurrent falls, you get this hypodense ble uh, bleed, across the surface of the brain. Generally, they'll be very well, maybe a bit of headache, a bit of slow progression in uh, weakness. These are generally not so dangerous compared to the acute subdurals, but uh, you need to know that, you know, the, and in an elderly person, when, you know, they start slowly getting confused, especially after recurrent falls, this is something to think about. Uh, guidelines are the same, essentially more than one centimeter, they need to come out. And if there's any neurological deficit, weakness on one side of the body, confusion, they also need to come out. So depending on the age, yeah, this is, you know, when they become dark already, that's, you know, they've crossed the chronic border. Sometimes you can have an acute on chronic, you know, mixed density blood and so on and so forth. Okay. I'm not going to spend too much on this. All right. Now, there's this thing called subdural hygroma. You might have encountered when you're in the ED before. You did a CT scan and this enlarged CSF spaces. Sometimes they may be part of just an atrophic brain, you know? So sometimes you wonder, hey, this one subdural, should I refer or not? Or is it a chronic bleed? Similarly, in infants, so you'll, you will see this commonly and you don't know whether to, to what to do. Okay, so if it's a, something called a hygroma or a chronic bleed, basically there may be a tear in the arachnoid layer, they form a ball valve opening and then CSF spills into the arachnoid space. But, or even if it's atrophic, you know, there's no mass effect on the brain. But how do you determine? Okay, one of the signs which I find quite helpful is something called the bridging vein sign. If there is a subdural there, right, then you will not see this bridging vein, okay? Because the bridging vein is crossing from the cortical surface to the dura. If there's a bleed there or something that is exerting a mass effect on the brain, other than cerebral spinal fluid, then this vein will not be visible. So this is one of the little, little hints to tell you that I mean, this is just a benign collection of CSF around the brain, all right? Okay, 
we come to our third entity this evening i mean this evening this morning this is called subarachnoid hemorrhage so the commonest cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is not aneurysms it's trauma all right the commonest cause of spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage where the patient is sitting at home nicely is due to aneurysm so this is a common misconception huh? so trauma still contributes the most to subarachnoid hemorrhage but how do you differentiate so typically a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage will be on the surface of the brain right near the site of direct impact you know uh, and compared to uh, the picture on the left you see diffuse deep seated subarachnoid hemorrhage in the region of the circle of willis now yes so this is some of the ways to differentiate can you get this sort of deep seated subarachnoid hemorrhage in trauma yes in very high velocity injury sometimes it can there can be a vascular injury number one number two do not forget sometimes somebody is driving a car and they get an aneurysm bleed someone with our kl traffic jam it can happen it happened to my panolong kanan ham of my school name not to be mentioned and can you imagine when he came in and you know, luckily he was still conscious he had a he had a bleed and he crashed his car and he came in with a head injury and everybody thought it was a traumatic event but when we luckily we considered doing an angio and we found an aneurysm all right so keep your, your mind has to be open to possibilities as well lah. of course not every patient you catch and you do further assessment but these are things that do sometimes happen you know taking a history of the trauma don't just write motorbike versus car it's not an mma fight you need to find out what exactly happened right and it requires you to go down to the ground to find out sometimes especially when you are young doctors young specialists it's important you know then you get a better acumen down the line okay so we've covered subdural extradural subarachnoid hemorrhage now we come to the term contusion a lot of you who are not in directly within neurosurgical fraternity will always wonder why the neurosurgeons like to complicate things instead of calling intracranial bleed intracerebral bleed they like to call contusion sometimes so i'm here this slide is to sort of clear the doubt on why this con this whole controversy occurs okay now a contusion basically is an area of disruption of brain parenchyma with an intact surrounding pia and arachnoidis definition now, now hemorrhage occur due to injury within uh, of vessels within that injured brain right so it's a combination basically of injured brain and clots inside uh one of my old friends and mentors used to use the term that brain has the consistency of tofu right imagine what happens if you drop tofu it will just smash so that's similarly sometimes what's going on uh, in, in when you have a contusion direct impact on the brain and it in gets injured it gets edematous and whatever blood vessels there also uh, uh, rupture so how is this different from a clot from a burst blood vessel you know like a intraparenchymal hemorrhage in ha hypertension see the clot in hypertension is uh, hypertensive hemorrhage is purely just uh, blood products now the contusion on the other hand even though it looks can look similar on the ct scan is the combination of injured brain and clot and they behave differently all right that is the key thing how do they behave differently number one so remember as i mentioned the contusion may appear as you know uh, it can be solid clots or it can have this thing called salt and pepper combination of uh, hypo and hyperdense and and they have a lot of edema around them okay so this is the natural process or natural history of uh, contusion it is a very dynamic process right it tends to show progressive increase in mass effect on repeated imaging and usually in the first 6 to 9 hours so a uh, equal clot a contusion of a certain volume will cause much more mass effect compared uh, to uh, just a simple intraparenchymal bleed so your threshold to intervene is going to be higher all right so here are some of the factors associated with radiological progression in severe injuries definitely coagulopathy if somebody has to go for cpr then naturally the contusion has a higher chance of blowing up elderly patients if it's a early scan you know short scan and if they have multiple hematomas these are all potentials for a contusion to expand and this is the most important undergone surgical decompression you have a clot on one side you take out the clot the opposite side contusion can expand this is uh, those of you young guys who are in neurosurgery will know this is very common we 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 take out one side and then uh, you know we intervene uh, soon right so here's a show of some of the common uh, type of injuries that occur right uh, you have depressed skull fracture oh, sorry you got a contusion under a skull fracture you have a you know coup and contra coup contusion over the side of injury uh, gliding because of herniation and so on and so forth okay i won't spend too much time now intraparenchymal bleeds 
can occur in in uh, what you call it trauma as well i know this is a little bit confusing okay why they tend to be deep seated and is usually related to very high velocity injury small tears occur in the blood vessel in the brain the deep in the brain intimal injuries but when you see this you automatically know it's a very high severity injury and the prognosis is not fantastic all right even though they 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 don't progress sometimes but you know may at the most you may need an evd so do understand that you know the it's a it can be rather heterogeneous all right so when do you intervene for a traumatic parenchymal lesion usually if it is in the frontal and temporal basis greater than 20 cm volume with midline shift at least 5 mm basal system if uh, effacement you take them out you know collectively you have to take them collectively or any lesion that's more than 50 cubic uh, cm in volume should be also treated if they are not then if the patient is unconscious definitely icp monitoring and intervention if necessary okay okay here this is a very unique uh, lesion this is bleeds occurring in the posterior fossa so whatever guidelines have showed you are predominantly for supratentorial lesions the posterior fossa is a very narrow space and sometimes you cannot stick to just your 1.5 cm guidance okay so see in this case the patient has a posterior fossa extra dural right and it doesn't look like it's reaching the 1.5 cm mark but you notice in front here in the image in image a the fourth ventricle is uh, is compressed the basal cistern is compressed this is a sign that uh, what you call it the patient definitely needs uh, intervention you know and you see compared to the lower image after the intervention the cistern is open so you cannot stick to your 1.5 cm uh, guidance so in in even in the guidelines they say mass effect on ct scan is defined as distortion dislocation or obliteration of the fourth ventricle what you just saw in the image with compression or loss of base, basal cistern so and maybe the hydrocephalus these are criteria to we use the term tight posterior fossa so if this is there in a posterior fossa lesion you don't have to wait for it to fulfill the size in which was spoken about in the supratentorial compartment so please remember this and posterior fossa pathology because of the small size of the posterior fossa they can rapidly deteriorate so you have to jump on them quickly okay so those are the common bleeds that you will see right now a little bit about herniation so what is herniation herniation is a shift of intracranial tissue from one compartment in the brain to another or from the intracranial compartment outwards this is a, usually an effect of raised intracranial pressure you know it's a focal effect and of course the 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 manifestation of herniation will depend on the location and the type of the herniation so presence of herniation is a immediate indicator that surgical treatment is required so the commonly used measures of herniation is midline shift so see the the there are the olden way is you draw this straight line you know from one internal bony landmark to another but we have moved away from that all right now the correct ideal way is to you select image where you can see the foramen of monro that's what fom stands for the foramen of monro is the one that connects the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle at that level you draw a line from the inner cortex of the bone and you measure inner diameter that is a all right then you draw another line from the inner diameter of the bone to the midline structure known as the sp septum pellucidum that's your b now then you take a you divide it by 2 and minus by b then you get your measurement of midline shift so if it is more than 5 mm then it is considered significant all right so this is an important slide for you all to know and you know stop you move away from this old way non scientific way all right now basal cisterns this is another thing that anybody looking at a ct scan should be aware of basal cisterns are csf filled spaces at the base of the brain so you have your supracellular cistern you know it's shaped like a star you got your interpeduncular cistern here you know in between the cerebral peduncles and the most important the smiling ambient cistern you know and quadrigeminal cistern the the side ones are called the ambient cistern the one in the middle is the quadrigeminal cistern because the quadrigeminal plate is there so they give rise to a smiling face and if the the smile is wiped out or partially wiped out that is a sign of effacement we use the term effacement okay what does that mean it means there's some pressure pushing from the top either centrally or from the side and results in obliteration of this space all right it's a sign of central herniation and you know it's definitely one of the important indications for surgical treatment so here is a picture of a subdural here you can clearly see with significant midline shift you know with even without measuring you can tell but 
you know but this if you had to measure this would be the place you would have to measure you know you can see the formula of monroe okay uh, sometimes you have a pathology in the middle cranial fossa you know typically your temporal extra dorsals that result in something called uncle herniation so uncle herniation uh, until they it affects the brain stem the patient may still be conscious you know, in the early stages and they only show changes in the third nerve why because you see this white arrow this is the temporal uncus encroaching into the supracellular system so this is where the third nerve will be running to be uh, the, the, the crural system so when it starts pressing on the third nerve that is already a sign you know the early we call it early third nerve stage so yes but it's if you can identify this uh, on a ct scan you know then you already know even though the pathology may not be up to the size that you are worried about intervention is required so you must look for this sign uh, uncle herniation you can see the uncus encroaching into the crural system see i am showing you this particular slide to see don't you see the basal system is smiling so you might think that hey nothing wrong lah basal system is okay but yes this is something to be aware of okay another type of herniation you see is subforsine herniation the brain shifts under the fox so these are also things you can look for you see in the in the image which brain, usually midline shift will answer lah okay i've shown you central herniation so central herniation as i have mentioned earlier you know you lose the ambient and quadrigeminal system the smiling face is gone because of downward pressure okay a small note on something called dure hemorrhages now you notice in this picture there is a small a thin pathology here in the middle fossa but there's a lot of uncle herniation and you see this bleed in within the brain stem near the pontomedullary region this is a result of central herniation when downward pressure causes shearing of the basilar artery or vein branches and there's blood inside the brain stem this is a very ominous sign the patient is going to die in 12 to 24 hours all right so usually this means that the the the, the boat has sailed lah but i think it's important to be able to even identify the dure hemorrhages eh, to know that you know that perhaps you know it's it's already very severe and maybe too late okay so how do you measure hematoma volume so this is a simple method called the modified kotari method it takes into account the greatest hemorrhage diameter in the an ap uh, what do you call it uh, this one you choose the cut where the biggest size is you measure ap's length and width right that would be your a and b now to take your c you need to know how you need to count how many slices you can see the clot on right and you need to compare those slices to the size of the clot with the bigger size all right if the 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 size of the clot in the next slide is more than 75% of the biggest clot you count it as one if it's between 25 to 75% of the largest clot is half and if it's less than 25% you count it as zero because this you don't want to over measure the clot volume so you have to use this and then you times it by the slice thickness so just say you can see it in like seven slices then you have to times it by the slice thickness not seven directly because then you will over overshoot the shot so if it's usually typically like uh, like here 5 mm cut it's 7 times 5 mm so you will get 3.5 so just say theoretically ap is 5 uh, cm b is 3 cm and then this one will be 3.5 times 7 uh, or times uh, i mean uh, Uh, whatever 0.5 you get the value and you divide it by 2 that's how you get a clot volume but remember this is ideal for one round clot parenchymal clot right for extra dural subdural width is definitely more relevant right this can be used for contusions ideally all right so i've given uh, this is a little bit more about brain edema you notice in this picture the brain may not there may be no midline shift you see the cysts may be open but you can you see the gray white matter differentiation is lost so this can be related sometimes to hypoxic changes right or it is just diffuse brain swelling and if this progresses and in you put in icp this progresses we may need to do a decompression you don't take out the clot you just remove the the bone you know the bifrontal bone to give brain space so you see even in this image you have to look at the top cuts and compare both sides then only you will be able to see this hemispheric edema in patients like this okay Uh, a little bit about axonal injury axonal injury is a condition where uh, usually after a high velocity injury the patient will be usually you know not conscious but they don't have very significant injuries on the scan you just see this little little punctate hemorrhages occurring you know in the deep gray white matter the corpus callosum you know in the brain stem so sometimes you have to consider the possibility of axonal injury but remember nobody 
with a head injury who gets up, GCS is good, and then drops his external injury. Never forget this. Huh? So sometimes people try to explain everything, saying, oh, this one is external injury, external injury. No, 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 it's not. It's not. So there's a, even an MRI-based grading for DAI. Why am I highlighting the word MRI? Because sometimes you cannot see on CT scan. You may or may not see these punctate hemorrhages on CT scan, but it's something to consider. In the early stages, it's within the lobes of the brain. Second grade, it goes into the corpus callosum, and finally, it goes into the dorsolateral quadrant of the brain stem, the very severe one. So these are kind of cases where MRI definitely is helpful, particularly something called SWI, susceptibility weighted imaging. Look at this T2 image. Hey, it looks like fine, like. How come this child, you know, this person is, you know, so unwell? But when you do the SWI, you can see how many dots there are in all the nerve tracks. So, DI is one example where you know you kind of explain or you want to prognosticate the patient why they are not recovering. Ah, uh, you can do an MRI. Okay, so if we talked about the bleeds, a little bit about the fractures. So skull fractures, you know, can there are so many varied in their you know, appearance. It can be depressed. It can be stellate. Uh, you know, there can be an underlying contusion. You need to look at the bone view sometimes. If not, you will miss uh, skull base fractures. And if you, how do you, for the, those of you, the junior colleagues, this is a common algorithm they use to differentiate a skull fracture and a suture, especially when you're looking at a, a CT or an X ray for the early stage in your life, you may have this confusion. Uh, okay, so generally, a fracture is, has a smooth or jagged edge compared to serrated. Serrated means burgigi, you know. The sutures tend to have that serrated edge. Fractures tend to occur in a straight line. They won't be, they won't have a curvy, you know, undulating sort of pattern. And they turn very suddenly. So, and uh, they tend to be thicker than the, your sutural lines and darker, and they can occur in any location. Sutures will be in a specific anatomical location. Very often, especially in the, those who are paired, like the coronal or lambdoid suture, you can see them both sides, you know. So, these are ways to compare. And they tend to be less thick, less dense, right? Okay, uh, this is a, a picture I want to highlight because I want to show you this fracture involving the temporal petrous bone, you notice, and it is crossing through one round area. If anybody can tell me what this is, okay, I know you all are muted. I'll give you 30 seconds to think or less. Okay, no suspense. This is the carotid canal. So this is the kind of patient where you should suspect the potential for a carotid injury, you see? You, you have to look for this. You can see it nicely transecting through. It may not manifest early. Patient may be very well, but they can come with transection. Similarly, here you have a fracture extending through the air sinuses. Potential for CSF leak or even sepsis infection in the air sinuses is, you know, can happen, empyema. So these are things to consider when, when you see this. Okay, so generally depressed skull fractures, huh, when you surgically treat them, is you know if they are more than one, uh, one uh, table depth, that means the thickness of the, uh, the thickness of the bone, right? So usually non-operative management of depressed cranial fracture is uh, one of the I mean is is uh, is one of the things to consider if it's clean and it's not very depressed. But other than that, generally. Uh, you know, if it's good, depressed down, it's causing a contusion, you need to, to remove it, lah, right? And if it's near the frontal air sinus, usually we cranialize the air sinus to reduce the risk of infection. Okay, a little bit about pneumocephalus and CSF leak. Uh, you see, if you look at this image here, you see this hyperdense, very black areas in front of the brain. This is a typically how I mean, a pneumocephalus will look like, right? So pneumocephalus basically means there's some communication between the external environment and the brain, either the, the uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the nasal sinuses or external area. But when it's thick like this, you know, and it's actually, you can see it's indenting on the brain, this can be a sign of something called tension pneumocephalus. So this thing is called Mount Fuji sign because it looks like the front of the brain is pressed down. So this is what Mount Fuji sign looks like. But remember, you sometimes you can have the sign, but the patient can be completely well. So it's a combination of the radiological finding and the clinical signs of race ICP, you know, when you to dive, define tension pneumocephalus. So tension pneumocephalus has to be treated immediately to reduce to this one. Okay. Uh, lastly, a bit about craniofacial fractures. Uh, these are things also you look out for. Remember the Lefort fractures, which uh, you know can affect the maxilla, extend into the nasal base, and you know, ex uh, you know the type three is right. You know, this causes disconnection of the skull base. I think uh, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to. But essentially, these are all the spectrum.
spectrum of things you can see on a CT scan, you must be thinking about all this, you know, not just focusing on the bleed. Okay, so to prognostify injuries, right, we have commonly used some of the grading systems, uh, like these things known as the Marshall CT grading of brain tumor, of brain trauma. This is for di diffuse brain injury, not for diffuse axonal injury. There's a common confusion. Any diffuse brain injury, many multifocal bleeds, cerebral edema, confusion, all you can apply this. So if you have a normal CT scan, they believe the mortality is, you know, even in the you know diffuse brain injury, mortality is only 9.6%. But if there's systems open, but shift less than 5 mm, it goes up to 13.5%. If there is midline shift more than 5 mm and your brain's, your basal system is, is affected, automatically it goes up to 56.2%. There are additional category Category five and six for un I mean remove uh, clot. This thing is in all these categories. This value is only uh, used if there's no clot more than thirty cc volume. If there's a clot more than thirty cc volume, they are automatically upgraded to grade five and grade six because the prognosis will automatically depend on what is the nature of the bleed and all those things. So this is basically when you don't have a clot volume more than thirty cc and you only have you know cerebral edema, multifocal contusions. You know something that doesn't need surgical treatment. Okay. Uh, to, and you notice there are some shortcomings of that Marshall grading. So there are other newer scoring systems like the Rotterdam CT severity index that takes into account presence of intraventricular blur and subarachnoid hemorrhage or epidural mass lesion. All right. And then you are given a score. And based on this score, sorry, based on this score, then, you know, you can actually calculate the percentage of mortality. And, you know, you have six categories. And naturally, if you have Similarly, I mean, you notice that all of them still go back to basal system effacement and midline shift because these are indication of herniation. All right. And additionally, there are some newer scores like the Helsinki score, the Stockholm City score, you know, that add on additional parameters, you know, like subdivision of the type of bleed or the SAH, the presence of SAH, whether it's in the convexity or in the basal system. But see, basically, here's a, a system, uh, uh, an analysis that was done to compare these systems. And they find that uh, using a base model that consists of the age, the pupillary responsiveness, and the GCS, and hemoglobin, and glucose, these are all independent prognosticators for head injury. And you add on one of these uh, CT grading scores, you get anything between 0.39 to 0.44 Nagelkirk's pseudo R squared values. You know, this is a multivariable regression model that helps to predict head injury. So you notice. The Stockholm CT score is tedious, but it actually, you know, is, is, is slightly better than, you know, just using the Marshall or the Rotterdam, but I mean, this is more for academic interest, lah, you know, sometimes it's very tedious to do this. Okay, so back to the interpretation algorithm, just a recap of what I showed you just now, all right, and uh, this is the way the ED trains you guys to do, which I think is not a bad thing, because when you're starting out, you, you know, mnemonics is very helpful, so they, they use the term blood can be very bad. So blood, look for epidural hematoma, subdural, intrapenicoma, intraventricular, subarachnoid. Then you look at the systems, you look for presence of blood, effacement and asymmetry in the four key systems. You know, you're looking for basal system effacement, right? You're looking for brain. Is there any midline shift? You know, is the gray white matter affected, cerebral edema going on, right? And look at the ventricle, any intraventricular hemorrhage or hydrocephalus. And lastly, you look at the bone for skull base fractures, uh, you know, uh, facial fractures. So this is where blood can be very bad. So to start out your career, it's not hard, no, not wrong to use this as a beginning, right? So here, see, here's an example. So where are the, you know, with so much going on. So you, when you talk about blood, there is an acute subdural, there is an intraparenchymal bleed deep inside, there is a temporal hemorrhage, there's intraventricular hemorrhage, there's interhemispheric hemorrhage, there's subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay? Systems, the systems, basal system is effaced. There's significant midline shift, right? Brain, you notice the color of the brain, especially on the opposite side, contralateral side, there's a loss of gray-white differentiation. Uh, ventricles, there's, I would say, compensatory dilatation, not so much hydrocephalus per se, but there's definitely blood in the ventricles. Bone, in this cut, you can't really see that much fracture, but you have to think about looking, you know, for fractures as well, but in the bone setting. So, see, at least you have this in your mind, you can go through everything and not miss any injuries. Okay, so what are the commonly missed injuries? Even though we are very thorough sometimes, uh, only with experience, sometimes we get past this. 
small subdurals, especially you know when it's uh, you don't look at the subdural window, you can miss it. Interhemispheric or tentorial bleeds, you know, can be missed. Isodense subdurals can be missed. Blood at the frontal or temporal base because the skull base, you know, overlaps with it. Remember, I told you the mathematical averaging issue. You can miss it. Small interpeduncular bleeds. Lesions right on top, vertex lesion, you can underestimate in because the last cut, you just see a little bit of hyperdensity, you think it's nothing. And of course, DAI and pneumocephalus sometimes are missed. Okay, so I will let you have a look at this scan and see whether anybody can identify what is the lesion of the bleed that has been missed. Okay, so this scan looks pretty normal, right? No midline shift, nothing much. Can impact. Can you see here and here? Interhemispheric bleed. One of the common things that people sometimes miss. Okay. Other than that, ah, okay. In this image, what can you see? No, it's not uncle herniation. Before anybody jumps to that. Okay. There is a small contusion in the temporal lobe. I give you that. But you notice there's a tentorial hemorrhage here running along the course of the tentorium, you know, it, all indicators of significant impact. Ah, okay, so the pathology is on the right or on the left? So right, say number one, left, say number two. Right side. Right side, fantastic. So you'd be surprised sometimes a lot of people tend to focus on the atrophic stroke when there's actually a sub acute uh, uh, sub chronic subdural here, you know, which needs to be drained. You can see a very sharp cut off from the parenchyma here. Uh, sometimes commonly missed, you know, and if you do and a patient with stroke, they will already have neurological deficit on one side. Sometimes they're confused. You may not be able to, you know, you get the history of sudden onset weakness, you know, and only when you examine and you pick up and you find the asymmetry in clinical features. And here you have an interpeduncular bleed in the subarachnoid space. You see, sometimes the patient can have third nerve palsy, and you 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 be wondering why 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 because the third nerve runs through this, and this sort of pupillary changes. Uh, a patient may be conscious and well and not having any symptoms, and you'll be wondering why. You'll be worried, and you know sometimes you want to do certain intervention for you know, a small lesion that may not be required. So this is sometimes why you need to be able to identify the interpeduncular bleed. Uh, okay. So you see, this is an example of what I mean by a vertex lesion. When you look at the very top slide, you just see like this layer of blood. That's all. And it's like, ah, yeah, nothing. The rest of it is fine. But if you look more carefully, you notice how significant the lesion can be. It's just that the last cut undervalued it. So if you don't ask for this reconstructed multiplanar view, you are not going to see this. Remember for extra durals particularly. So patient can seem fine, no symptoms, you know except for chronic headaches. If you don't ask for this, you won't see this. Okay, so I've explained to you commonly missed lesions. So common pitfalls of treatment with the medical, with the some summary, I mean, some case scenarios I'm going to show. Number one, missing subtle signs. Clinical signs, this one is something where you have to examine the patient and don't read the sign only. La. Try, try, it's not easy. You are nowadays practicing medicine where you see the scan before you see the patient. I know enough neuros surgical MOs and they come for their master's evaluation all, we can tell. You are used to seeing the scan and then matching the scan to the patient's symptoms. But actually, it is the other way around where you learn and you don't miss things, all right? Inadequate coverage of area of imaging. Sometimes you don't ask for the right sequence or the, like multiplanar view or you don't ask for imaging of the right area and you can also potentially miss injuries, right? So not requesting for additional appropriate imaging and of course, if the timing of the scan is too early, and there may be some nuances towards age, like you see uh, lines running through the bones, which are actually not fractures, but just because they are the pediatric age group, you know. So these are the common pitfalls in image, uh, this one, illustration. Okay, a bit of case illustration. So this is a six-year-old girl who was found unconscious in her home with a small amount of bleeding from her scalp. Nothing else was happening. The father was sitting behind her on the couch and suddenly, she just fell down and started bleeding from the scalp. No loud sounds, nothing. And she, when she was brought in, her GCS was around 14 with significant weakness over the right side of her body. So this is her CT scan for everybody to see. So you see a, a, a 
uh, foreign body is sitting, you know, within the deep in that the white mantle near the frontal lobe, and you see all these hemorrhages everywhere, right? So, when you see a foreign body, I find doing an X-ray is uh, not a bad idea, and that's the X-ray that I showed you in the first in the beginning of the presentation, all right? Now, when I when you see that, you see that you, there's a small foreign body sitting at the base of the skull. But how did it get in? And one might naturally, you know, if from a neurosurgical perspective, they'll try to open the front and get in. But what has happened is, without looking at the multiplanar view, you will realize that the, the, this foreign body has entered the brain through the back here, and this is its trajectory. And when you're dealing with a penetrating injury, you need to uh, wash out and clear up the whole track. If not, the potential for abscess formation and all is there. You know, you need to debride along the track. So that's why, you know, looking at the whole the 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 whole thing and getting multiplanar views are very important for a case like this. So this actually see this is supposed to come before. My bad, sorry. So you see, if you are looking at this lesion, you might consider just opening down here and get in. I don't know. Okay. So this is exactly what happened to the patient. You see, this is the intraoperative image uh, going through the contusion, and you know, I'm clearing up the track and you know securing hemostasis. I actually entered from the top, so I can clear you know little by little, and. Just for everybody's fun, uh, this is what uh, this one. Uh, you can clear the lesion. You can clear the lesion, huh? right? Uh, and you can take out. If you look clear clearly, you can see that the bullet is being delivered right now. Okay. So once the lesion is delivered, uh, so you have to debride the whole catheter. Okay. So this is uh, the child, one month after surgery, you know, the hemiplegia has corrected itself. So, you know, it's, if you get it right, you can, there's no risk of hemorrhage and so on and so forth. Okay. So that's an interesting case, just pointing out that you need to do sometimes multi-planar views to be able to see the, the lesion. Okay. So second case illustration, this is a 19 year old girl that was involved in a road traffic accident where her motorcycle collided with a car. She complained of pain over the left side of the neck and right shoulder, which everybody thought is just soft. I mean, nothing like, you know, injury related soft tissue injury. GCS full, she had a lot of bruises on the face and the limbs. There was a comminuted fracture of the acetabulum and the scapula. So that tells you it's a very significant impact. But brain, no bleed, no fracture. Cervical spine, no fracture. Very good. Everybody's happy. They admit her. She developed sudden onset right-sided weakness, you know, on the, after 24 hours in the ward with the power of three out of five. So naturally, everybody is a bit worried. CT scan is done, just showed some hypodensity, bilateral ischemic areas in the MCA territory, predominantly on, uh, on one side, you know, on the left side. So CTA brain of the brain is reported as normal. So what would you do next? MRI? Okay. So you see, there's already ischemic changes in the brain and well, the, the, the lesson here actually is if you if the CTA had included the neck, then they would have picked up what you can see here. There's obvious traumatic bilateral dissection, a very dangerous condition for this patient, you know. So with such, a, can you see the shoestring appearance? And it's just below the skull base. So usually they will cut off the CTA brain at the base. So fortunately, we, dis we, you know, we requested for this additional image and we managed to come up with this bilateral carotid dissection diagnosis, right? So I use this opportunity to just uh, uh, like inform you about something called the Denver criteria or the Memphis criteria. So if you have any cervical spine fracture with unexplained neurological deficit, or if there's a basilar cranial fracture into the carotid canal, like what I showed you just now, Lefort fracture type 2 or type 3, or there's a cervical hematoma, there may be a brui asymmetrical reflexes, or an ischemic stroke occurring right after onset of, you know, in a young patient particularly, or, you know, patients with severe uh, GCS less than 6, or after hanging injury, like this one is, you know, if they are lucky, you catch them, like, a lot of times you won't get into them in time. These are situations where you need to consider uh, a CTA of the brain and neck. Remember, brain and neck, not just the brain. You can miss things, All right? So this was actually her images. I just wanted to, uh, you know, there was a reconstructed view, but you can see in the sagittal and coronal how it becomes so tapered down, you know. And remember, the injury commonly occurs at the base of the skull because it's a, from a mobile segment of the brain to an immobile segment, right? So you can see, you know, the you see the the contrast through the carotid is completely gone. So 
of course when you diagnose this then there will be a further angiographic assessment to look for you know uh, that the the nature uh, of the the dissection injury law is there is an intramural hematoma is it a raised intervenal uh, intra intimal flap or if there's a pseudo aneurysm forming and then the ma management may be different from sometimes anticoagulation to they may need stenting by the ir interventional radiologist okay and uh, there's some and the rate of stroke vary according to which form of uh, dissection is there it is a bit too much so essentially patient was anticoagulated and after three months of therapy the power improved and her fractures uh, you know against all odds i made the orthopedics not touch her because even stopping the anticoagulation for a short while potential for because it's bilateral it's very risky so we had to unfortunately keep her in the hospital with external fixation but everything turned out well okay Another case, uh, head, um, MVA, motorcycle with a motorcycle with a GCS of 12 on admission. CT brain just showed a lot, small left temporal contusion, no cervical fracture. All right. This small contusional uh, drop or spots on the scan with a normal CT scan of the cervical spine. All right. Post trauma day two, he develops left sided weakness and pain. No headache, no neck pain, no other complaint. Cranial nerves were normal, but the motor power was you know, completely hemiplegic, zero to one out of five. With uh, you know hyper reflexes, plantar going was down going on the right and equivocal on the left, and sensation was reduced on one side bilaterally. So you know we are like, well, what's going on? Do an MRI first, lah. So you see, do an MRI. I don't see anything significantly abnormal. I'm wondering what else could be do going on. So fortunately, we went on to do an MRI of his spine, and lo and behold, there was an extra dural hemorrhage at C5 to C7. You can see this image and this is how it looks like intraoperatively so it was removed and of course we made a progressive recovery so remember sometimes you have to excite if you don't ask for this image the additional imaging one will just miss the injury crack or not and taking it out makes all the difference in the world in terms of his recovery so you know coming back to what are the common pitfalls i'm telling you know knowing where to image and you know thinking about additional imaging sometimes is important so the, his diagnosis was basically traumatic EDH with brown sequat syndrome. Okay, last case to show you, 53-year-old male. This one is bordering a little bit on spine, but I think it's relevant, you know, when you're talking about brain and spine. Patient came with vomiting, headache, and lower limb numbness and heaviness. No back pain whatsoever. GCS is full, but when you examine him, the hip flexion was only four out of five. Reflexes were hyperreflexic, planta upgoing with loss of sensation and pain to pain and temperature from L3 to L5. Normal anal tone and the bulbocaminous reflex. This is the CT brain, just a bit of contusion in the front. And CT cervical uh, reconstructed view, Ooh, so nice. No fracture, no malalignment. So, you see, everything looked fine. Why is he having these symptoms? So luckily we did an MRI and you can see this nice big clot here uh, on the sagittal axial image. And they are, this is when I opened up the dura, you can see a big clot there, clot evacuated, all the nerve roots are free. So remember, MRI can be used, needs to be used when, you know, the neurological picture doesn't match. So don't just stop at uh, all the CT is normal, I'll send the patient home, you know. And you as young doctors, especially you have to yeah, be your patient's best advocate. You have to ask for things, you know, then only you will get them. Especially when our, in our resource limited situation, I mean, there's no fault of anybody's, but, you know, sometimes we mean to know when to ask for the test and when not to, you know, you can't image everybody. I do agree. Okay. So this patient had a cordae equina syndrome from a compression of a traumatic subdural. Okay. A little bit about timing. Now, what is an early scan? Uh, a sc early scan is a scan done within two hours of an injury. And, you know, if it may miss lesions and not identify them at the point of maximum size, typically like extra dural, it will expand with usually within the first six hours. So you must think about the swell sign and how early you're doing the scan. Similarly, contusional size will can expand if it's done early, especially if there are multiple cofactors going on. Subdurals typically will expand in the first 24 hours, right? So knowing the timing, eh, any scan done within two hours of the injury, you must consider early scan and not always just uh, brush them off as nothing can happen. So yeah, see, if you do an early scan, you may see a small contusion which can suddenly progress to a much larger size like in this image. Okay, I've shared this image before, this natural history, I think I spoke about earlier. All right, so something to think about timing. A small note on one size does not fit all. There's no question, CT is needed for children. You know, when you have a trauma, it is uh, needed. But when we image radiation matters, you know, radiation can cause a lot of problems. You know, children are more sensitive to radiation. 
what we do now last their lifetime remember so when we image we image gently so more often more is often not better i mean as we progress through our career we must think about all this so what can you do you can based on the child size you can use a lesser kvp and ma you can talk to your radiographers about this you just do one scan single face is often enough scan only the indicated area and there are protocols for ct in pediatrics you know uh, as you progress through you know you will start thinking about things like this right but remember indications are similar to adults there's no such thing as a child i don't want to do the scan it's not indicated because i'm scared because the danger of uh, intracranial hemorrhage is is very there is there right so the risk of cancer associated with most diagnostic radiation and its use should not be restricted when needed for correct diagnosis so any medical procedure has a risk and diagnostic radiography is no exception be aware of this all right so there is something called the quick brain mri in pediatric traumatic brain injury i think we may not be able to catch up with this right now in our setting but it's something to think about in the future it's a 3 to 4 m meet, uh, minute sequence of rapid mri just limited sequence you know with a diagnostic accuracy as good as ct and standard mri you you do a axial sagittal and coronal t2 weighted fast spin echo so you can get the images in 1 to 3 minutes so this is you know just something consider in your in a difficult spot with a child all right only thing is sometimes the child may need to be a little bit of sedated sedated for a bit but yes sometimes can be utilized okay my last thing is a bit about advanced imaging i've shown you about what is susceptibility weighted mri to look for di then we have something called diffusion tensor imaging this is a new thing that looks at the tracks running through the brain brain and you know there's breaks in tracks like this you can actually tell that the prognosis is not so good and the potential for future injury, i mean uh, recovery is less and this is something called mrs you look at chemicals in a particular part of the brain this is definitely more relevant for neuro oncology but they find that in trauma also sometimes you know if there's a build up of lactate and all these things it indicates you know a uh, great uh, acute injury ischemic injury and you know there's a lesser amount of chemicals normally produced by neurons then you know that that areas potential for recovery is less these are a lot of this is experimental you know and and lastly there's something new that's on the horizon called connectomics see we no more view the brain as just this lobe and this track but rather the brain's function is based on how one part of the brain communicates with another this is called a connectome so uh there's a whole different way of viewing the brain from rather than the from the anatomical perspective you actually do functional mris and you see which parts of the brain light up on with different tasks so uh this will be helping us in managing post uh, surgical injuries and also how to what do you call it intervene sometimes you know stimulating using magnetic stimulating stimulation for certain parts of the brain so we are i think in the process of slowly acquiring some of this technology for helping patients but essentially yeah this is uh, the way the future lies lah so i think uh, with that i've come to my last slide i know it's been a bit long so i thank you for your you know your patience and uh, thank you once again to the emergency sig group for a great job i hope you all keep this up i hope this session has been helpful uh, i'm happy to take any questions or oh, all right thank you Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rego, for a very fruitful uh, presentation. I learned a lot of new things. Um, so um, I open questions to the floor. If you have any, I I think uh, we have uh, some from uh, emergency and also uh, uh, from the neurosurgical um, fraternity uh, MOs as well. So I think this is a very good uh, um, op op uh, opportunity for you to ask to um, the experts. Um, and I think Mr. Regu is happy to take any question. Do we have any? Okay, I think there are some questions in the chat box. Um, okay, Mr. Regu, I just uh, wanted to ask you. Um, How about the antibiotics coverage in a patient with um, a skull fracture? Because I think it has been a bit of controversial. Some say you may not, uh, there is no much of evidence to support uh, prophylactic antibiotics administration in a skull, patient with skull fractures. But some says that, you know, it might be beneficial. So can you elaborate on that? Thank you. This thing is definitely still a little bit of a controversy. Lah, because, I mean, the issue of benefit versus non-benefit is, If the, if the, I mean, uh, you're worried about 
uh, infection versus super infection with a resistant organism. That's the bottom line. So they say prophylactically starting antibiotics may affect the normal flora and or, you know and result in you picking up a more resistant organism. I think this one you have to go according to your institution institutional guidelines lah. Because I have worked in a few different centers. Some people we start antibiotics straight away because the potential risk of uh, super bug. But there is some validity to the you know not using as well lah. Because sometimes you can subtly miss uh, a subtle CSF leak, you know, occurring in the back of the neck, you know, I mean, in, into the throat, which is, doesn't manifest in front. So, you know, by the time you pick it up and then at that point in time to treat it, you know, the meningitis is already on, uh, has occurred. So I still say this one is a little bit of a institutional variation. You need to talk to your local neurosurgeon. Uh, but I feel I would, uh, because, you know, considering the large amount of rotation of patients that we see, sometimes it's, I would err on more of starting antibiotics. Lah. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Reku. Uh, we started having questions. I think initially they were a bit scared and, and a bit shy. Lah. Malaysian kan malu-malu. Okay, so um, uh, there is a question here. When is AED indicated in traumatic brain injury? Okay, so as it stands, uh, anti-epileptic therapy is indicated uh, for head injury uh, as part of the prophylaxis for seizure control. Lah. It's, and it's usually indicated for one week. Uh, and as it stands, I think phenytoin is the one agent that actually has been approved in the guidelines. Candrepra, they are trying to get it on, but it's not fully in the main guidelines just yet. But for one week for seizure prophylaxis, all right? Beyond one week, if you develop seizures, that's a different story. Then you the therapy can be extended for a longer period. But if not one week, and typically if you have an injury like a depressed skull fracture or any sort of intraparenchymal bleed, then it is indicated. Sometimes uh, simple things where there's no direct cortical injury and all, then uh, by right anti-epileptics is not really indicated, right? In subdural, intraparenchymal bleed, depressed skull fracture, these are conditions where uh, you know anti-epileptics uh, anti are definitely indicated. But for prophylactic purposes, one week, not more than one week. All right, thank you. So um, and the second question, uh, can you discuss the use of uh, transdermic acid in uh, TBI patient? I think anti-epileptic Mr. Regu has already answered. Yes. So. Okay, so tranexamic acid, as you, as you know from the CRASH-3 trial, it has shown, you know, to have potential benefits in um, uh, in traumatic brain injury, you know, pro, pro, uh, the reducing progression and generally outcome is a little bit better. Now, earlier there was a lot of apprehension with uh, things like, you know, the potential for thrombotic complications, but I think the CRASH-3 trial, this large-scale trial has actually shown us that it is quite safe and you know there are benefits in patients in the severe traumatic brain injury cohort. So yes, definitely tranexamic acid, there is a benefit. Lah, right? Does this apply to pediatric age group? Okay, I can see the <laughs> chat box as well. So yeah, anti-epileptics across the board, it does apply. Lah. But okay, the thing is in a very young, uh, the, the amount of guidelines and robust data is a little bit lacking. Lah. So I think we have to be a bit judicious and use our judgment when it comes to very young children infants because of the potential complications related to seizures. Generally, a lot of the guidelines pertain to adults. For pediatrics, they tend to be more judicious with the use of anti-epileptics. All right, thank you, Mr. Regu. Just to add on about the uh, transdermic acid, actually the treatment of transdermic acid is within three hours of uh, uh, of trauma itself. So actually the emergency doctors are the one who is responsible to give. But what I observe most of the time, if the patient comes in moderate to severe head injury, they will administer, but not for the mild traumatic brain injury. So basically the patient can actually deteriorate later on as what we see in um, uh, Mr. Regu's uh, slides. Um, so I think um, you can administer it. Um, it. They have more uh, strong evidence for the mild and moderate uh, uh, patients with traumatic brain injury. So um, and they have found out there's not much of uh, uh, side effects being seen if it is being administered within the first three hours, followed by one gram over eight hours of infusion. For pediatrics, it is about 15 mg per kg. Maximum is uh, one gram uh, for uh, PITS age group. All right. So. Um, all right, we have uh, one more question. Can you give tips again to detect tentorial bleed? Because sometimes it can be very subtle sorry, sorry. and easily missed. Yeah, I think I agree okay. with- so uh, tentorial uh, bleed. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 it's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's difficult. Bleed. 
yeah it is definitely challenging you got a sort of look of for it remember any high velocity injury yeah, you need to go through the 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 slides which are near the tentorium the cerebellum to look for this you know very subtle icing like appearance you know of the bleed yeah it may not may not have significant implication in terms of need for intervention but the presence of this injury there itself tells you that you know that this uh, impact is significant and potential for you know uh, to monitor like uh, it's there you know it's not just a simple concussion how to look for it okay ideally uh, you have to do a coronal view uh, uh, to look at it but i think uh, to say tips to look for it i think you must have that index of suspicion when there's a high uh, severe injury and then you know you go through the slide slowly carefully you and if you require us for multi planar views to roll out i think i think a lot of the centers now have specs and you can just easily do a 3d recon you know to be able to view so this is some of the ways you can you know detect it if you are not sure all right okay we have one more question from um dr chao mm -hmm. about hydrocephalus versus ventricular megaly okay so yes this is another area there's a lot of confusion sometimes uh, whether uh, it's really the ventricular dilatation due to build up of csf with high pressure or just atrophy of the brain so okay some of the easier things you can look at is you look for periventricular lucency uh, I, i don't have the slides to show you this but essentially periventricular lucency is hypodensity around the ventricles that's one okay additionally you look for whether there's effacement of the brain around on the surface of the brain no if there's a high pressure build up especially in a younger patient the sulci and gyri will be effaced right then um you can look for something called a callosal angle usually if it's a atrophic brain the callosal angle will be wider more than 110 degrees in a, a hydrocephalic brain the ventricles tend to grow inward so the degree becomes i mean the callosal callosal angle created by the lateral uh, i mean the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle tend to be more narrow and will be less than 90 degrees so these are some of the things you can look at uh in doubt also you can evaluate the patient you know, other than raise icp symptoms sometimes chronically elevated you need to look at the optic fundus to see whether there's fundoscopy so remember never discount that and there are things you can do called pulse fertility index you use a, a doppler machine you know and compare the pulsation this is something things we used to do in the university you know to tell us that there's a drop in pulse fertility then there's a build up in cerebrospinal fluid so hence these are some of the things you can use to determine between ventricular megaly and hydrocephalus okay thank you very much uh mr rigo one more question from me um you presented a very interesting case on a patient coming in with uh, hemiparesis following a uh, carotid uh, artery dissection so how do you differentiate this uh, from a patient who eventually suffered from an ischemic stroke because i think we have dr ashraf here who is a neurologist um and and after the onset of the stroke uh, this uh, unfortunate patient ended up with a um, fatal motor vehicle accident and presented to the emergency department so how how what are the tips that you can share with us from your experience um on how to differentiate these two okay so it want i mean uh, i think one important thing is uh, that it goes back to you are taking a proper history if possible i mean may not always be there but you cannot shortcut the evaluation of the patient you know, sometimes when it comes with trauma people just don't bother to get the i know pre existing diseases you know and you know clinical observation of weakness that's one radiologically uh, if i mean of course when you do a early uh, um, a ct scan um, the ct scan may not show uh, signs of a ischemic stroke even you know in a in a patient who is you know coming in without dissection so but your clinical examination may show you what asymmetrical reflexes and weakness on one side and if the thing is from the onset of the injury and your bleed or your finding on the ct scan are non concordant these are things to think about and remember not only the brain spine also huh? because it can also manifest with hemi hemi pattern of weakness uh, compared to things like dissection or tend to typically take time to develop because after the injury then there's the intimal injury and then the thrombosis takes place usually it's a delayed onset of weakness so you automatically know it's not a stroke from the impact but you know something that has occurred after that uh you can't take away the 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 portion of you know being thorough la in your assessment and you know considering the possibility all right thank you very much
Okay, um, we have one more question. How did the bullet end up in a four years old girl brain? <laughs> yeah, this is a very interesting question. Yes. Actually, okay. Uh, so there was a lot of investigation. So apparently somebody was uh, on the roof of the home. So it's a zinc roof. So they removed the part of the roof and were attempt aiming for the parent, but missed and hit the child. But I think it hit something else before it hit the child. That's why the child is still alive. Because a direct impact, the child would have not made it to the hospital. So it's a, what you call a ricochet injury. And if you look at that image, you can see the bullet has gone all the way in, hit the base of the skull, and then it has sprung back up into the middle of the parenchyma. So. I see. Very interesting case. Okay, we have one more. Um, how to differentiate between hypertensive versus tumor versus traumatic intraparenchymal bleed. Okay. So when you see a hyperdense bleed in the center of the brain, huh, right? Uh, usually a few a few things must trigger in your mind. Okay, when you see a clot and uh, one is clinical aspects, is the patient young, no history of hypertension, nothing. Uh, is there any pre-existing neurological symptoms? Then automatically you will find the question whether there's something hiding underneath that is you know manifesting as a bleed, number one. Number two, when you look at the bleed in itself, uh, you see the story says, today I developed the sudden onset symptoms. When you look at the scan and the clot, has a lot of uh, perilational edema, which is incongruous or not matching with the onset of the symptoms. That is another sign that there may be a lesion there, maybe a tumor which is giving this edema and then it has manifested with the hemorrhage. Sometimes you are lucky, you see calcifications, you see uh, tortuous vessels, then automatically you know there's uh, you know some other problem uh, uh, going on in the brain, la, you know, which could be the the underlying lesion. Uh, so this, your brain should be, you know, queuing into preceding symptoms, onset. Okay. Okay, uh, one more question. Um, the usage of reversal in assessing GCS in a sedated and cute patient casualty, yes or no? Some EPs are not happy in giving reversal. I think I'm, I'm, I'm one of it. <laughs> Okay, so you see, this thing uh, is, uh, you talk real world and you talk practicality. Okay, real world, uh, definitely reversing a patient just for GCS assessment is not the safest thing to do. Lah. Especially when they're intubated, you can actually potentially worsen the clinical condition. right? And if you look at a CT scan, you this is why looking at the scan and inferring the patient's condition is very important. You... Very unlikely when you have a very pristine scan and you have a fixed and dilated pupil, yeah, right. Uh, it doesn't match right now. There's no signs of herniation. So even if you, you want to declare somebody brain dead, one of the important prerequisite criteria is there must be an explanation for why this patient is brain dead based on a CD scan, not a matter of just uh, uh, what do you call it? A uh, CD scan is uh, uh, if there's a bleed there, so it immediately, you know, we want to assess. So you see, I think that's where you have to use your judgment a little bit. If you look at a scan which is terrible, a lot of like things like dure hemorrhages, I suppose in those kind of situations, maybe reversal to decide whether you're going to let the patient go, perhaps there's a little some role. But by and large, I think if you have, you see an obvious lesion, we have to trust our colleagues. Lah. That's where the level of training has to improve so that, you know, GCS assessment by A is equivalent to GCS assessment by B. So there's no magic in the hand of the neurosurgical MO or resident, you know. But of course, I don't realize there are difficulties, you know, depend on based on geography and where you are and all. Uh, but by and large, that's where, you know, inferring the patient's condition and, you know, not everything is just reverse, reverse for reassessment. La. You look at the patient's condition and decide. Sometimes you can cause more damage. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Ego. I think um, uh, the issue of reversal agent is not that uh, we are not happy, but because using flumazenil in a patient with traumatic brain injury or some brain insult can eventually um, cause patient to have seizure and it's an intractable seizure. To stop the seizure is not using phenytoin, you have to use propofol on top. So it is something that you do not want to cause more harm for the patient. So that's why uh, me personally, I'm a bit resistant on that part. But yes, I agree with you. Um, it has to be case by case basis. Yeah, and eventually we can off the sedation and then maybe they can come and assess after later on because we don't that use something. That is probably a, a one option. Yeah. But Nasrina, the incidence of seizures from fluman resonil, how high is it? You know the statistics. Huh? Okay, so that, that that shouldn't be just because you've picked up yes, on a rare yes. complication. Uh, so to, to be fair, uh, in favor of the other side. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. 
Okay, do we have any more questions? All right, um, if we do not have any more questions for Mr. Regu, um, I would like to um, say thank you to Mr. Regu for um, uh, spending his time um, with a wonderful lecture today. All right, uh, so hope to see me. I think he will be giving more lectures somewhere next year, if I'm not mistaken, all right, about uh, submaronite hemorrhage, okay? So um, how hopefully everyone learned something from today's discussion, okay? And hopefully uh, we can, because in treating neuroemergencies, I do not believe in one person managing the whole uh, situation or scenarios. It starts from the maybe emergency department, then we pass over to the um, neurosurgical colleagues and subsequently the rehabilitation uh, doctors. So you need a, a chain of, of uh, people to basically come up and ensure the patient uh, to have a good outcome. So again, thank you very much, Mr. Regu. And um, um, we thank hope you, to see you. you again in next session. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank